and welcome to the panel session on uh, COVID-19 and cardiovascular health. Uh, my name is Vesna Todorovic and I am Chief Editor of Nature Cardiovascular Research, uh, a new research journal in the Nature portfolio dedicated to publishing the most recent uh, exciting works on cardiovascular and blood biology, including by basic uh, translational clinical and public health research. Tonight we gathered uh, some of the most prominent Berlin scientists and uh, clinicians to discuss this uh, very important subject, and that is how uh, cardiovascular uh, health is related to COVID-19. Um, I will introduce them in a second, but before I do that, I would like to actually inform you how uh, the, about the format of this uh, panel discussion. So. For an hour, we will discuss uh, certain subjects all related to COVID-19 and cardiovascular health. And while we are discussing the, uh, the subject, you can actually type your questions into a uh, Q&A box mm -hmm. that, that you can see at the bottom of, of your, uh, the, the application. Please do not type in your questions into the comment, uh, I'm sorry, chat box. That's reserved only for technical issues. So if you have any technical issues, you can actually type them in into that box. But if you actually want to ask a question, then you sh should actually uh, type in your questions into the Q&A box. So um, I will introduce our panelists in the alphabetical, alph alphabetical order, starting with Holger, uh, Dr. Holger Gerhardt. Um, uh, he's professor in experimental cardiovascular research at the Charité and the Berlin Institute of Health, or BIH, and the speaker of the German Cardiovascular Research Center um, at the Parton site Berlin. Uh, he's also, well, he's um, a highly uh, successful and productive scientist, maybe I should say above all these things. and. Uh, he also leads the Integrity Vascular Biology Laboratory at the MDC. And the research that they're doing that lab is focused on uh, deciphering the molecular and genetic um, underpinnings or um, mechanisms that underlie uh, the function of, uh, functional for, uh, uh, formation of uh, vasculature and uh, in health in disease. And then we have Dr. Michael Potente, who is a, both a scientist and a clinician, cardiologist, actually. Uh, he heads the Angiogenesis and Metabolism Laboratory at the Berlin Center for Translational Vascul uh, Vascular Medicine at the BIH. Uh, he also is a practicing cardiologist at the Charité Hospital. And his laboratory studies uh, the metabolic processes that control growth and remodeling of vasculature in mostly disease models, but I guess in health as well. And uh, moving on to Dr. Life Eric Sanders, I hope I pronounced your name right, uh, who is also a medical doctor specialized in respiratory medicine and infectious diseases and also uh, a professor in immunology of infectious diseases and vaccine research. His group at the Charité currently focuses much of their efforts on dissecting the human immune responses to SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection and how they impact severity of COVID uh, disease and the generation of protective immunity. His lab has made a number of, of uh, contributions uh, related to the effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection on the immune system and the immune responses to COVID vaccines. He coordinates several collaborative studies, such as PA COVID-19 study, the Deep Phenotyping Platform for COVID-19 in Charité, and COVID, a German, Germany-wide net network to investigate the immune responses to SARS-CoV-2. Then we have Dr. Birgit Savitsky, pardon me if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> she is a professor in translational immunology at the Berlin Institute of Health. She's trained as a biochemist, but then over the years, uh, during her research uh, years, she developed the 
um, a great affection for uh, immune system and immunology. And I read somewhere that uh, she said every aspect of immunology is very exciting, but her favorite cells are T cells. And I'm sure that everyone who doesn't even have a minimum of scientific training uh, has heard about T cells during the pandemic uh, because they seem to be very important in our um, immune response to uh, COVID, well, SARS-CoV infections. SARS-CoV-2 infection, and you'll hear more about that from uh, very good later, and I, I suppose live and everybody else. So her favorite cells are T cells. And last but not least, we have here Dr. Emmanuel Weiler, who is a molecular biologist like myself, and he has started working on coronaviruses and SARS-CoV-2 is a coronavirus uh, long before the pandemic. And uh, uh, he uh, was working on the regulation of gene expression of viral infections. And then when the pandemic started, his focus became, I guess, exclusively COVID-19 and actually SARS-CoV-2 as the subtype or type of coronaviruses. So um, this panel discussion, as I already mentioned, is going to be about how uh, cardiovascular health is related to COVID-19. And uh, uh, we, it, it's basically general knowledge that uh, uh, we are going to focus on three major key su uh, subjects. It's uh, general knowledge that people that uh, suffer already from cardiovascular disease um, are more prone to uh, have a severe form of COVID-19, and we will discuss why is that. Uh, we will also discuss how COVID-19 itself uh, can induce cardiovascular disease, uh, and uh, there are very wide range of cardiovascular diseases uh, that can be caused by COVID-19, such as uh, arrhythmia, high blood pressure, uh, myocarditis, uh, et cetera. And finally, we will discuss uh, how can we actually protect ourselves and others from this disease and all these uh, quite unpleasant con consequences uh, for a cardiovascular system and other systems, and that is by vaccination. Um, I forgot to mention, but I think it, it's quite clear that COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 is actually a virus that attacks uh, the respiratory system. But nevertheless, it became uh, quite obvious over the two years that they've been in, in this pandemic, that it affects uh, other organs as well. So we are going to focus on uh, specifically on cardiovascular um, and blood uh, system, but uh, we will also touch upon other, other subjects. So um, Emmanuel, uh, let's start with some introduction of the main character of the story, which is SARS-CoV-2. Could you please introduce this? This, uh, to this virus and uh, tell us uh, why is it so special and what is it? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 is a virus like many others and it's a respiratory virus. So it enters our body through through nose and, and the throat and then it would start to replicate and become more and more within the cells that kind of line our respiratory path. And in that matter, it's not so different from other respiratory diseases like the ones that cause the common cold and they are very common all over and of these uh, common cold viruses there are also other flu coronaviruses which are constantly circulating since since decades like essentials we don't really know this and which have been discovered um, about 50 years ago um, SARS-CoV-2 is one of the more dangerous coronaviruses but not the only one we had the first SARS of pandemic, uh, it was not a real pandemic because it was contained relatively quickly about 20 years ago. And then there was this MERS virus about 12, uh, 10 years ago. This one, the MERS virus is kind of better for us, I would think we can say so, because it hardly spreads from human to, to humans. It's uh, transmitted from dromedars um, to, to humans, but then rarely from humans. And I think what, what makes SARS CoV 2 special are like two features. So the first one is SARS-CoV-2 has many mechanisms to hide itself from our immune system within the cell. So when it enters the body, it can start replicating without, by hiding a bit. And so this means that our immune system doesn't really realize that there's a virus there. So it can continue to replicate and become more and more. And this means that 
if the immune system doesn't really realize that you have a, a virus in your body, it means you don't have symptoms. So these classical symptoms like coughing, fever, and so on. And this means you're infectious while not even realizing that you have a virus in your own body. And this means it can spread relatively quickly because people that are not sick or don't feel sick, they usually don't stay at home, but they go out and, and by that they can spread the virus. So this is the first feature. And the second feature is obviously that SARS-CoV-2 is not a harmless virus. It can cause a range of, of aspects of diseases, the ranges of, of disease severity. Of course, we know a lot of risk factors. Age is, I think, the prime risk factor the older you are. The more you are at risk to develop a severe disease of, um, of their uh, contracting this virus, but also young, healthy people can, can become severely sick without that we know all these risk factors, the genetic ones or uh, kind of required risk factors and so on. And I think these are the two aspects. So it can spread quickly because it can hide itself in a way. And secondly, it can cause severe disease. Um, one thing that we can also discuss today, Pat, and you mentioned this in the beginning, um, it's all often termed kind of multi-organ disease, the, um, what is caused by infection of SARS-CoV-2. But it's actually not clear whether this virus infects organ outside the respiratory tract and particularly for the endothelial cells or the cells that are lining our blood vessel there is an intense debate going on so for example last week there was a paper that said there is no infection of endothelial cells and this week there was another paper that kind of claimed again that there is yeah. an infection of these blood vessels again and this is also important to kind of fully understand this disease and also offer treatment options because if there would be really in many cases serious infections of endothelial cells or other thrombos or heart tissue, then of course treatment options would also need to be different. That is a great point and actually a good introduction for my next question. And that would be uh, um, how does the, the virus enter the organism? So which are the cells that are targeted and which are the cells that actually cannot get infected? Uh, life could would you be so kind to maybe um, I can, uh, I can give it a try. So um, early studies uh, showed that specifically cells of the upper respiratory tract, and I think, and, and Emmanuel and everybody who, who knows uh, more of the current literature, please jump in, that ciliated cells uh, are infected. And in fact, the, the entry factor that was uh, described uh, by Stefan Brümann's group um, in, uh, together with, with Christian Dawson's group uh, here in Berlin, um, which which few uh, cardiovascular guys obviously have known for a long time. Uh, and that seems to be highly expressed on, at the tip of those uh, ciliated cells and then the sort of a good entry site for the virus. It also um, gives the virus an advantage because if you really uh, infect the upper airways, proximal upper airways and replicate to high numbers, obviously, it's easy for the virus to spread before the immune system even has had a chance to neutralize uh, the virus. And, and this is also why around the time of symptom onset is really when people are most infectious. And, and, and that was first shown also, um, I think in principle by a group in Munich, again, together with Christian Drosten here in Berlin, that where they followed up a small cohort of, of, um, of the first patients in Germany, actually that had, that had uh, been infected at a conference and return back to their employer uh, in, in Bavaria. And then when they tracked uh, you know, all the, um, the, the source of the infection, it became pretty clear that people that are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic would be infectious. And that was basically a game changer and, and Emmanuel alluded to that. So it infects the cells of the upper respiratory tract. And then you sort of, uh, as at least that, that's my understanding, uh, migrate down, there was a pretty good paper um, that came out in cell that showed that there's sort of a gradient in the in the bronchial system uh, that the that the density of the viral replication sort of goes down the further down you go into the respiratory tract nonetheless um, a certain fraction of people does develop pneumonia but that's really only a fraction that's i don't know 10 to 20 percent really depends on age precondition the viral variant that we're dealing with of the, the infectious, uh, the, the, the inoculum, if you wish, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the initial dose that you received. So there's many variable, variables around that. But so it's really, some people only have the infection of the upper respiratory tract, experience very common symptoms of any viral disease, uh, flu-like symptoms. And then in addition, there's this 
uh, loss of smell and taste in some people. We can probably discuss how much we know about infection of, of nervous cells. Nervous I was about cells. to say those are completely different cells. They're those are different cells. In, um, yes. There is a group, again, a charity yeah. that showed, you know, that the virus may enter through some nerve fibers of the olfactory tract. And um, and so all of those symptoms basically, but they're pretty unspecific. You could you could have those symptoms with other mild viral infections as well. And then the fraction goes on to develop pneumonia. You really have infection of the lung parenchyma. But what is notable is that in those patients that we talk about most, those that we have on the ICU that we need to treat with the organ replacement therapy, uh, there's it, that, that really occurs in the second and the third week of the disease when actually the viral loads have already declined, the immune system has already kicked in there. There usually has been seroconversion, that is, we can detect antibodies in the serum. And so viral replication is not the main issue anymore, but there seems to be an unchecked host response. Part of it is inflammatory response, tissue damage, uh, 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 coagulopathy, uh, and, and of course, you know, then distant and collateral damage to other organs. And, and that's when, when this whole thing really goes awry and, and people have to be on, on, on or are dependent on, on organ replacement and mechanical ventilation and so on and so forth. And I think that uh, part of the disease is still pretty hard to treat um, versus we, I think, had some good success in developing some of the antivirals we have monoclonal antibodies and other uh, uh, treatments that have, that have been introduced recently. And just today, there was a, there was a news uh, yes, uh, a press release by yeah. Pfizer and so on. So there's really two phases here. And so, you know, it, it starts in the upper respiratory tract. That's where the virus always goes. And then in some people, it, it spreads to the lung. And then we can discuss the other organs um, with the specialists. But, but I guess that's in principle how we, how we think the, the infection uh, um, is basically playing out. So what happens when the virus enters the, the, the cell? What, the, what does it do there? Well, you have to ask the virologists in the, in the room here. Okay. <laughs> so, so, I mean, obviously, you know, you, amount of his, um, yeah. you've studied that in cell culture and extensively at the single cell level. So. Yeah, so, so I mean, what happens when, when the viruses, they attach themselves to cells and thus has I pointed out it's mostly at the beginning cells of the upper respiratory tract, so nose and throat, um, some specific cell types in there. And so the virus kind of gets into the cells and what it essentially does is replicating its own genome. So it's like- May it, I interrupt yeah. you here? Because what I was actually getting at is um, there are two features, I think that are important for the entrance of the virus. And that one is what the virus has on, the, on its surface. And another thing is what the cells have on their mm -hmm. surface. Yeah, and I like, think that is the uh, actually what, uh, what makes the, the virus so selective because some cells are susceptible to infection, whereas others are not. So why is that? Yeah, so, okay. Um, so, so, so there are like two, two aspects that you just mentioned. So what is on the surface of the virus is the so-called spike protein. This is actually also what is Or called. S, I think everybody and, knows about the uh, S protein. <laughs> yeah, this is really, you know, like these things that like three years ago, nobody was talking about, but now everybody knows what it's exactly. spike protein is. Um, it's actually also funny because these, these first pictures of coronaviruses in electron microscopy are from the 1967. And already there, you can see these spikes on the electron microscopy. And this also that's called corona because that's the crown. Yeah, anyway, so I mean, and, and this is perhaps something we can, because it's also always a question to me. So the virus attaches to cells via a molecule, which is on the surface of our cells, which is called ACE2. And this is it's a receptor. Is, exactly, the so-called receptor and ACE. A stands for angiotensin converting enzyme. Yes. And this is a key feature of, of the cardiovascular system. This, perhaps I also have a question about that for the specialists later. Um, <laughs> and then it enters the cells and then it creates its own copy machine, so to say. And then it makes out of one virus that enters the cells, there can be like several thousand that can then, then at the end leave the cell and then be transmitted to the next person. And perhaps what, I, what we could also, perhaps life could also uh, extend on that. I mean, there are like cells to which where the virus enters and then it gets more and more and then it gets out. And I think an important aspect is also that the virus enters specific cells of the immune system and 
like the so-called macrophages or cells that are patrolling our airways. And, and this is, I think, also where a lot of that can start, right? So, but can we agree on one thing that cells that do not express this receptor code called ACE2 cannot be infected? Or is there uh, still a question mark hanging over this, this uh, claim? Yes. There is I a mean, question mark. Because I mean what I think life should should extend on this because what, what the, the virus Please. also does is <laughs> that it enters these so-called macrophages, so these big eaters, so these cells that control the, the airways and then also react very strongly to the uptake of the virus. But these cells do not take, don't do not use this ACE2 protein, these receptors like the other cells in the airways, but they can still take up the virus and they also have a very strong reaction. Right. And do we know how they uh, get infected? Or this is still unknown? I think life is. Well, I think we have to uh, distinguish between productive infection, that is replication of the virus, and just uptake of, of viral the material. Viral and macrophages per design are, you know, they phagocytose particles yeah. and dead cells and infected cells. And that's probably what they do in the lung parenchyma. They, uh, they phagocytose previously infected now apoptotic uh, so cells or debris of cells. cells prepared, that's yeah. basically yeah, it's, uh, um, that, that, that's basically what they're what they're designed to do. They also take up free viral particles, but they are really not uh, permissive to viral uh, infection. So okay. you cannot you can even challenge them in optimal conditions with high viral loads, and you will not see viral replication. So they're not permissive to replication. Um, they're is some debate as to whether certain cofactors, in addition to ACE2, play a critical role. For instance, for um, for the um, some of the variants that have emerged, this question has come up. Um, we know that certain proteases are involved in processing the spike and you know enabling quicker uptake and, and so on. But there are also several large studies describing cofactors. And that might also underlie some of the different susceptibilities of people of different cell types of different mm -hmm. tissues. And uh, but but if we if we look pretty hard into the you know autopsy studies different tissues, it's still primarily the cells of the respiratory tract that are infected. There's huge expression of ACE2 obviously in the in the in the kidney and in other organs, but it doesn't seem the that this is as well, right? The intestine, uh, there are viral particles in the intestine for weeks after the infection that can be yeah. detected by PCR. Um, it's also might be that the intestine is a site where the immune system still That's learns it. about the virus and exactly. matures. There was a nice study from New York uh, that showed that. Um, so there are other organs that have the receptor, but but where the where the main pathology uh, occurs is the respiratory tract, yeah. but but it can cause collateral damage elsewhere. And these cells are called epithelial, and they actually line uh, the respiratory, uh, let's call them pipes, or basically spaces, luminal spaces. They're at the, they're at the yeah. air liquid interface, if exactly. you wish, right? So they, first, they form the outer so the, barrier, there, and, exactly. and, uh, and, and that's where Between you the encounter air, the outer world. And, uh, exactly. Um, so uh, once we have these. Uh, Cells that are susceptible to the viral infection and replication. How does our immune system react? What happens next? Birgit, can you uh, okay. tell us? I mean, already the cells are getting infected, and where the viral replicates, they start to uh, respond to the viral infection by releasing what is also in the press uh, um, very widely discussed: the so-called type one and uh, interferons and type three interferons. And um, they act on the infected cells, but also the neighboring cells and uh, elicit a program that uh, inhibits viral replication. So to protect the neighboring cells um, uh, against the uh, viral infection. But um, this also already acts on the, on the uh, next line of our immune response on innate immune cells. And they also recognize the um, virus particles with certain receptors they have, so-called pattern recognition receptors, so they recognize that there is some harm, um, some danger of uh, pathogen entering the body. And um, uh, so they are part of the so-called innate immune response, reacting very fast 
and they are present um, also there in the lung um, so that they can react very fast, but they are not specific to, um, they react against an, um, any kind of pathogen there just by recognizing certain patterns. First line of defense. First line, well, yeah, I would call the, the epithelial cells. I it's always say that the barrier already is, is a very important um, first line of defense because if that is defective, this is yeah. no, the patients are anything. very susceptible to respiratory infections. And um, so this plays an important role, but then this, I would say the second line is the innate mm -hmm. immune cells. And they then um, uh, allow. Can you specify the which are the innate? Uh, well, the macrophages are. Part I, I just wanted to actually yeah. hear that because I'm not sure that our audience knows what macrophages are and what innate yeah. immune cells are. So the macrophages are part of the in, innate. Macrophages army. are part of uh, one innate. cell type belonging yeah. to the innate immune system. Um, but then we have also um, others uh, like dendritic cells, which can also uh, um, take up the viral particles and transport it to other cells of the immune system. To, um, but then a second or a third group of innate immune cells are the so-called natural killer cells, uh, which are very important in killing viral infected um, cells. And they get, for instance, um, activated by these type 1 interference released there um, also by the um, infected cells, but also and then special dendritic cells. So, so they, the they can act very fast there yeah. locally, but it is not specific. Um, mm -hmm. And it will not create what we immunologists always like to talk about, so-called memory, uh, which um, is really restricted to the adaptive immune system which helps to defend um, the body against the second wave or um, a second infection by the same pathogen much faster. And this uh, memory is more or less restricted to the adaptive immune cells. And they get um, in, really instructed by the cells of the innate immune system. So you have this uh, order that Cast. the first line is the barrier, the second line are the innate immune cells, and then these innate immune cells then instruct and present antigen to the cells of the adaptive immune system. And this is, of course, first my uh, favorite cell type, the T cells. Yeah. yeah, T cells. T cells getting uh, parts of the virus presented by uh, dendritic cells or macrophages. So, uh, and whenever a T cell has a specific receptor which can recognize this, uh, part of the virus, it will then start uh, to become activated and will uh, proliferate. And that means that uh, you get more of this particular T cell. And this is important. You want to get more of, this, of the T cells, which are able um, to react specifically to this virus and can then instruct further cells of the immune system. And this is the the other big cell type or um, important cell type of the adaptive immune system, that's the B cells, where we get the, the next important thing is, uh, from is the antibodies, which um, are only pro produced, um, mostly only produced if the uh, B cells get held by the T cells. And uh, the antibodies are so important because um, when released to the mucosal surfaces, so these um, uh, in airways, um, they can make sure that the virus cannot en enter into our um, cannot body. penetrate cannot into the cell. So they neutralize. Body. This is yeah. when people always talk receptor. about neutralizing yeah. antibodies, the virus, so that it cannot enter the body and replicate or and infect cells and replicate them. This is so in principle uh, how it works, and this is all fine. It's all normal. But it can sometimes go wrong um, if you get an over um, activation, for instance, of the innate immune system with release of um, too much mediators. They release the so called cytokines, but also um, what I forgot is a very important um, um, soluble component of the innate immune system is, is the so called complement. 
And um, this is important to mark pathogens, to mark the pathogens so that the cells normally can recognize them much better that there is a pathogen. But if you get too much of that, we've just um, seen that then it can um, uh, influence the activation of the T cells in, in a way that it that they um, become really screwed up and start to uh, injure endothelial cells, so the cells lining the vasculature, and that these um, activated endothelial cells then um, become um, also, as I said, activated and release mediators which attract more of the innate immune system, so you, have, you get an ongoing um, amplification of the activation, and that is over the top and can cause so basically, uh, we react normally to the viral infection by activating our immune system. So it's not inactive, it is active, but it is uh, activated perhaps too much in, 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 in the wrong way, exactly. which is what makes this particular viral infection so dangerous. And you just mentioned endothelial damage. So Holger, could you comment on that? What does that mean in terms of cardiovascular disease, vascular disease in particular? And then maybe Michael can uh, mm -hmm. talk us through the cardiac uh, issues that come as a result of COVID infection, COVID-19. Well, SARS-CoV-2. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, glad to do so. Um, we heard about the epithelial cells before, yeah. where the virus enters. The endothelial cells, they uh, line all our blood vessels. This is the uh, very thin, um, single layer of cells, um, and they are the largest surface. Um, so they're in contact in, uh, with blood. They're in contact, direct contact with blood. Yeah. This is where uh, blood flows through. Um, and they are, on the one hand, um, responsible to shape this and orchestrate the shape of our blood vessel network in every organ um, to enable nourishment, oxygen exchange, and nutrients, um, and all those things. But they're also the gateway for the immune system that we just heard about. Right. Because to enter from the bloodstream into any organ to fight any infection, they always have to cross the endothelium in both directions. Um, so we've been looking in detail over many years at how these vessels shape and how they manage to stabilize, become quiescent, as we call it, so that they actually perform their function. Um, but importantly, also how they disappear, because these structures are dynamic as we adapt our lifestyle, if something grows, you need more of these. If something doesn't Thanks. need, yeah. uh, shrinks or, you know, um, these are adapting to the tissue requirements uh, very rapidly. Best example is pregnancy, a huge stress on the cardiovascular system and there's a dramatic reaction to this. So um, our body controls the blood vessels very tightly to perform these functions. But as we now know from COVID, um, conditions in cardiovascular disease um, where our blood vessels don't form, uh, don't function as they should, seem to be tightly linked to the severity um, of the manifestation of, of COVID disease. And that's a very interesting point because it turns out that what um, Birgit described as a damage to the endothelium can be something that can have happened over years. Endothelial cells are longer cells in our organs can be, have happened over years. Um, at a low level, low level inflammation, um, and the same, some part of the same mechanisms that seem to really exaggerate during COVID can be taking over at low level and causing persistent damage. One thing that is in everybody's mind when we think about cardiovascular disease is high blood pressure. Um, and about 30% uh, of the population roughly um, suffer from high blood pressure. You know, these 40% cannot be treated with normal antihypertensive so-called drugs. And the idea is that this relates to a role of the immune system in the establishment of the high blood pressure. If you want, I can briefly mention the, what drives high blood pressure is, do, yeah. is, is three aspects. Mm -hmm. um, one is the volume of blood that we have, and this is tightly controlled by um, excretion and absorption. So our kidneys play a central role. The other is um, how hard our heart works. The volume with each beat that goes through the aorta into the system 
Um, and of course, the frequency at which that happens. Um, so stroke volume and frequency and the resistance of all our blood vessels. And this is where it gets really critical because that is tightly uh, controlled by many um, aspects of the endothelial biology, the metabolism of the endothelium, um, the mechanoresponse. So when blood flows over the surface of the endothelium, um, above a certain speed, the endothelial cells react to widen the vessel. This, so as soon as we exert more power through more heart um, uh, beat, this is important so that the system can adapt and, and go back into a, a healthy state. So that's an active response. There's also a passive response. That's the elasticity of the vessel. And this decreases with age. So here we have the second risk factor that we heard about age. Um, yeah. And so our blood pressure stiffness, creeps up right? as we get older, yeah. as our tissues get a little bit stiffer. And this is particularly true for the blood vessels. And then there's an um, intriguing aspect where the endothelium can become completely dysfunctional. So instead of widening due to this very important mechanical stimulation, they contract paradoxically. And this is an element of endothelial dysfunction that, um, pervade, that happens um, by metabolic dysregulation. Diabetic patients can have that. And this can happen not only in certain small spots, but it can be a systemic problem leading to heart failure, leading to all the end organ damage yeah. um, that we know of. So this could be a, a general precondition of the vascular system that if then you get this overreaction of the immune system on top can really exacerbate the problem. So you, uh, are you implying that basically people who already had a predisposition to uh, had some sort of endothelial uh, damage uh, when they're infected and have COVID-19 that will become more obvious and they will maybe be uh, susceptible more frequently to uh, this uh, sort of strong COVID-19 Whereas people with healthy endothelium uh, most likely won't develop these cardiovascular uh, or can, uh, one of the theories, can yes. even like a healthy endothelium suffer from COVID-19 and become sick sure, sure. and actually lead to the development of all this that you just mentioned, high blood pressure and then everything that goes with it, which is also something I would like uh, Absolutely. us to discuss. Absolutely. Both is true, um, yeah. but it is much of what we see because of the large number is correlation. Um, right. and, and then we have to dig in and see what's the actual underlying mechanism, what is causative and what is simply correlation. But it, it's very clear that a precondition seems to be a high risk for developing uh, severe, but it can also be that there's no known precondition um, right. and still you, you get this overshooting immune reaction. It's always a combination, and this is true for all diseases, what is your genetic background? What is your lifestyle impact? And, and what is the dose of the virus? You know, and what, how does the system react? But even when a when uh, virus strikes you, for example, if you uh, are going through some uh, tough times, maybe you know that will also reflect on uh, the, the general health of your organism, including endothelial health. And then if you get COVID in that moment, you might actually develop something that's quite serious. Absolutely, because stress is one yeah. of the factors that has an enormous impact on our cardiovascular system, but it also can be immune suppressive. Um, so absolutely, yeah. this, this can be a momentary situation. But I think for cardiovascular disease, it's a long-term lifestyle that predisposes you to be vulnerable for many, for many things, including COVID. And there's a clear link to obesity, metabolic syndrome, yeah fat that accumulates around the blood vessel that then triggers immune uh, reactions that drive hypertension. Right. Um, so there's lots of elements here. The good news is Give us some good you, news. Can, you can, like early onset diabetes, many of the early symptoms in cardiovascular uh, disease are reversible through lifestyle changes. So when we talk later about vaccination, that's an acute protection. But if you think about your life, um, you can be yeah. uh, working on your lifestyle to be yeah. Go less back susceptible. to that, to clarify, be what major. does that mean? You know, what, what lifestyle should we actually adopt? 
to uh, protect ourselves or to at least uh, ameliorate the, if we did have some consequences on, on, on our cardiovascular system uh, to um, make us you know feel better. Uh, Michael, mm -hmm. yeah, so, oh, to, to, to hold it. Um, so you mentioned these like different um, categories of, of high blood pressure, among them the ones that you can treat with, with ACE inhibitors, but then also like this low level information. Is there some data out there? Because generally I think one says that high blood pressure is a risk factor, but it is also a bit known which category of high blood pressure is more of a risk factor compared to others. I was actually on the phone with Dominique Müller today because he works on the gut microbiome and hypertension, and there's an interesting link there as well, gut uh, dysbiosis we talked about. And I asked him that particular question, and I don't know the answer yet, because mm -hmm. there is this immune component hypertension, and it would seem obvious that these patients would have a different course of COVID mm -hmm. than hypertensive patients that don't have that component. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, I can't give you the answer yet. And uh, it's after our first cursory uh, scan, it doesn't seem to have been answered yet. So I'll have to dig deeper. But there are so many questions about this disease that are un unanswered and we are learning as we go. So uh, Michael, could you tell us a, a bit more about the, the cardiac uh, disease as a consequence or uh, cardiac disease that predisposes people for severe COVID-19? Of course, that's not so. Mm -hmm. Uh, as pointed out, the COVID-19 is primary disease of the respiratory tract, yeah. but still we see um, the heart being affected uh, in some of the patients. And you can uh, define affection of the heart in, in various terms. So it could be a myocardial injury, so damage of the cells of the heart, the cardiomyocyte, can be heart failure, uh, just a heart failure, which is the inability of the heart to pump sufficiently the blood in the body. But it can also be arrhythmia. Uh, and arrhythmia can be something like atrial fibrillation, but also something life threatening like a sudden cardiac arrest. So these are some manifestations. Um, the majority of patients um, uh, which have a cardiac manifestation are asymptomatic. So you, you can measure uh, in the blood, for example, a fluid test like troponin test. This is a protein from the cardiomyocyte that when the cardiomyocyte gets damaged, it's released into circulation, and they're very sensitive tests. So it's an indication that the heart is sick. Yes. If you analyze and, one's yes. blood and that comes up, the exactly. heart is sick. Yes. Exactly. And you can measure this and you can see actually that um, uh, many patients that are infected with SARS-CoV-2 uh, do have an elevation of troponin, but they yeah. are not uh, they are asymptomatic. Um, still, there are some other patients, uh, um, individuals, which have uh, a kind of a severe manifestation of cardiovascular or cardiac disease, uh, which then uh, can be result of, for example, an inflammation of the heart called myocarditis. Mm -hmm. It can be the result of hypoxia. And because one should also not forget, the heart cannot be seen in isolation. The heart works together with the lung. And if you have severe lung disease, for example, I've mentioned in the yeah. second phase where you people on the respirator, on the, on the respiratory system, or on the respirator, they uh, have, when, by, they have naturally also an infection of the heart because there's much more strain on the heart. So it must, the heart must pump harder if you wish. Okay. So, uh, and this is of course uh, uh, also a problem. It can lead to relative hypoxia. And as you know, the heart is really dependent on a sufficient supply with blood with oxygen. There's not sufficient oxygen, it will not work as well. There can be other problems uh, that result in ischemia, which is uh, also hypoxia, but there's also an insufficient supply of nutrients. And that can be the result of uh, coagul coagulopathy. We heard this already. This is a yes. feature. So changes in the uh, in the propensity of the blood to coagulate. So and what you will see is a systemic increase in blood clotting. And that all yeah. affects the, the microcirculation. It can also affect the, the bigger vessels of the heart, the coronary arteries. And then that leads to kind of a, a myocardial infarction. Not the classical myocardial infarction that you see, for example, with atherosclerosis, but right. the so-called type 2 myocardial infarction, where it's more like a supply demand. A problem and where you cannot really see a clotting of the big vessels, but uh, more micro so, uh, Yes. Um, but of course, you can also accelerate atherosclerosis. It's an inflammatory process. You can also get plaque rupture, so the classical uh, etiology yeah. of a myocardial infarction. 
uh, but this is that is relatively uh, less common compared to the other types of, of coagulopathies we are seeing. So I'm glad that you mentioned coagul coagulopathy. I'm sorry, the, the making of the clot. <laughs> Uh, that means basically that uh, we have this, um, uh, let's say, uh, in layman terms, uh, coagulated pieces of blood in our uh, small caliber vessels. And these then move, go to different organs, and uh, basically result in uh, clogging these uh, vessels. So the surrounding tissue doesn't get the oxygen, doesn't get the nutrients, and dies. So if it comes to the heart, it gets to the heart, that's basically myocardial infarction. If it goes to the brain, uh, if it happens in, in the brain, that's a stroke. So uh, I have a question for Birgit and Folder. Uh, why do we get this thrombosis um, um, and this abnormal clotting uh, as a consequence of COVID-19? You have already touched upon this. So yes, like I just, I, I think, the most frequent type is actually venous thromboembolism. Uh, that's right. right. So, yeah. so that's something we noticed with the first patients. They all turned up with uh, thrombosis, uh, or and some of them, unfortunately, pulmonary embolism. Yeah. So, so this is why they, and we, this was pretty much shown very so early on that, that it needs to be treated. Actually, what's the, the clinical picture of people with, with such disease? Um, I mean, cardiovascular so, specialists are here. <laughs> um, so pulmonary embolism, I mean, irrespective of COVID-19, that the, the typical symptoms that you have is chest pain, short right. chest pain. Short pain. Um, some of that, you know, the people who develop pulmonary embolism are often like on the intensive care units. So there you already, sometimes you, you don't have these symptoms because the people are already on the respirator. So you need to um, have a clinical tests where you can look at um, in, in the ECG, you can do a CT scan, you can have blood tests where you can measure uh, products of um, of the coagulation cascade that are mm -hmm. uh, highly elevated. So, uh, and then you can of course see clinical symptoms like you know, change. Everybody change. talks about the dimer, so that's basically uh, yes. related to the story, right? Yes. It, this as troponin uh, in the blood, it's a biomarker that tells us if something's wrong. If something's wrong with our uh, blood coagulation. So um, actually, many patients that come into the ER with COVID get a uh, chest CT scan and many of them, if, 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 if your pulmonary infiltrates, that's what you actually can see also on an x-ray. Mm -hmm. They don't match with the, with the you know, desaturation or, or you know, the level of hypoxemia that we see. You'd often expect pulmonary embolism and, and quite frequently you actually see that people already come into the ER with, with pulmonary embolism because you know, this viral infection causes coagulopathy Early on, I'm, I'm, I'm really, that's, that's, I think, one part in physiology that I really flung for, is the population <laughs> and complement cascade, and uh, let's, so, so, so I hope yeah, you educate yeah, me a bit, yeah. but, but that's something that, that was noticed very early on, right. and putting everybody on, on prophylactic anticoagulatory therapy has really saved a lot of life, lots of lives, but that, that's really a, a hard clinical lesson that we had to learn very early on. And of course, lots of the research has focused on treating patients with higher doses, mm -hmm. uh, um, which so far, um, I think the trials are, are a bit discordant, but so far this hasn't really translated into a survival benefit. So it's not all just uh, coagulation uh, and, and thrombosis, but it's one major um, issue that, that I think right. many people unfortunately also have suffered from and, and died from. So I, I think uh, Birgit can tell us about yes. the uh, coagulation. That's what I wanted to start. But because we talked about the venous uh, thrombosis, I think, um, as far as I understand, there is a difference between what would normally happen if you had a localized uh, thrombus yeah. somewhere in the vein, and because of the direction of blood flow, you end up with pulmonary embolism. Um, that is an, an isolated event, but in in, in COVID. Um, there are all these, and a year or more ago, the first pathologist uh, who started uh, looking in autopsies of COVID people who died from, from the disease uh, saw multiple organs with um, micro uh, thrombus formation yeah. in, in many places. And, and there is a more and more evidence that the severe infection in the lung um, 
because in the lung, the, the cells that actually harbor the virus and the endothelium are in very, very close distance. And the endothelium is, is very, is very thin, so that there is a local yeah. damage to the endothelium where an interplay between certain immune cells and the endothelium that causes more endothelial damage will locally lead to thrombus formation with platelets, et cetera. So maybe yeah. big, yeah, you can tell us a bit about I'm coagulation. I'm not a uh, specialist, <laughs> but, but uh, this is maybe one special feature of um, SARS-CoV-2 that it apparently uh, leads to a very uh, strong activation of this complement uh, system we were uh, talking about, um, much more than other viral infections. And part of it is, for instance, that um, this the, the um, uh, very nice spike protein um, can elicit direct activation of the complement cascade. And complement is, as I said at the beginning, there is, is uh, very important in marking pathogens for the immune system, so to recognize that there is a pathogen entering the body. But if it is um, leading to an overactivation, then it can cause harm to the um, vessels. And um, it actually activates the coagulation system from them, um, but, but it also leads to um, the attraction of an immune cell type I didn't even mention yet. And it has to been shown very early on uh, to play a detrimental role, and that's the neutrophils, mm -hmm. um, cells of the innate immune system, which um, are attracted by. Um, certain products of the complement cascade um, that's really guiding the neutrophils to the, the um, place where it's um, released. And then they become activated and can um, further um, lead to an activation of the coagulation system and uh, cause direct um, harm to the vasculature. And a, a, a third layer, um, what I said is that uh, we've seen that the complement can also lead to uh, activation of the adaptive immune system. So the problem is the more virus you have, and this is viral load, if you get replication, you get more of um, these complement proteins activated, and that triggers a cascade which culminates in coagulation, for instance. I mean, the, the just one aspect. But. So if that happens, if it's diagnosed in, among COVID survivors, uh, what do you do? How is this treated? Is there a treatment that is sort of tailored for, for this uh, consequence? Or we just uh, fall back to, you know, how we would treat any thrombus or any type of thrombosis? Pretty much so, right? That's okay. what I'm giving and um, yeah, so we're giving either heparins or, or other inhibitors of the thinners, blood thinners, blood thinners yeah. if you wish, right? Exactly. I'm just trying to use and more blame absolutely. Terms. And and, um, and there are some trials investigating uh, the potential of antibodies blocking complement mm -hmm. pathways, and they've shown some early uh, promising yes. results. Mm -hmm. So you know, if you can block the upstream uh, activating mechanism, it's always better than sort of repairing the damage, um, as well as some other inflammatory markers that, again, control, for instance, activation and expression of complement factors such as uh, interleukin-6. It's That's like a, a very pleiotropic cytokine activates lots of proteins, for instance, in the liver. And, and um, it was given very early on in a very unsystematic fashion. Many people, many patients received it, and we've learned over the over the course of several trials that if you give this antibody at the very early stage when the patient is already sick, um, then you can actually um, then you can improve survival. So mm -hmm. I also have hopes for the for the anti anti complement antibodies, but I. I haven't seen um, any, you know, definitive clinical. But program. are they in, uh, used now in clinic? Uh, um, so the anti-L6 interleukin six yes. antibodies, both directed against the receptor of interleukin six as well as cytokine, cytokine itself, itself, is itself. standard yeah. of care, if you wish, in, in a selected set of patients. And this is not country dependent. It's uh, the same. Well, it's generally. resource dependent because monoclonal antibodies are are expensive, uh, are expensive treatments not yeah. available to in all settings. But um, but yes, this is this is basically become next to giving right. a very cheap anti-inflammatory treatment called dexamethasone, so basically steroids. Right. So this is 
in the next layer that's been added uh, to that. So um, let's just, yeah, oh, okay, please. I, I thought we should maybe add one component here because it, I think it's important to realize that coagulation is not just a passive, uh, you know, clot that forms because something happens only in the blood. And the theme of itself plays a very exactly. active role in this process yeah. um, in interaction with these neutrophils. And what is intriguing is that for platelets to actually aggregate there, um, you need cell surface receptors so that these cells will actually attach. attach. Normally, the endothelial cells will do everything to allow blood to flow freely. But in order to form such a thrombus, because you need these adhesion molecules. Yes. Exactly. And so a damage to the endothelium, either acute or um, in particular chronic, which is a hallmark of cardiovascular disease, will lead to an upregulation of these adhesion receptors yeah. and cytokine production by the endothelium cell themselves. So this is something that again goes into the box of risk factors and acute mechanism um, um, of the damage here. So I would like to go back to this uh, treatment of people that are sick. So uh, they're sick, uh, regardless whether they're vaccinated or not, but they have COVID syndromes and uh, we want to treat them. So what do we have in our toolbox? You mentioned anti-IL-6 uh, um, drugs that target either the cytokine or the receptor. Um, do we have something else? Um, I remember when I still uh, lived in, in the US, how Trump was treated. He was given a monoclonal antibody made by Regeneron. Can you tell us more about that? So you really have to discriminate between the early phase when the viral replication is really high mm -hmm. and you still have something to win by blocking viral replication, bringing down viral loads and preventing the whole COVID-19 disease to actually manifest. And, and so those are the antiviral therapies. Normally, antiviral therapies in rapid acute viral infections are very hard to establish. So we, in, in, in flu, we, um, um, there, is, there is one drug and it works beautifully in cell culture, um, but it's, it's, um, it's extremely it, Tamiflu and it's very difficult to, to achieve clinical effects with it in the clinic because basically it's such a short window where you can give it and usually it's, it needs to be given at a time when the patient doesn't perceive him or herself to be so sick. So those are antiviral therapies. With COVID, now slowly we're getting the awareness, okay, patients that are positive might need to seek care. So what can we do to target the virus? Very early on, there was some promise on a drug called remdesivir. Uh, and that's a polymerase inhibitor, but that was actually developed against different virus. So it's not really specific. And to be honest, we don't use it. Uh, it's licensed, was the first drug licensed, but mm -hmm. the clinical benefits are really marginal. It's quite expensive, also has some side effects, for instance, on, on the, on the, on the uh, kidneys. And um, so it, it hasn't really delivered that much, it needs to be given intravenously, so it, many yeah. problems with that. Mm -hmm. And um, so the next thing that was developed, and I think that have actually, apart from the story with Trump getting the Regeneron cocktail, uh, have really flown under the radar, and these are monoclonal antibodies directed against the spike protein that we've heard about, um, binding to the spike protein and then preventing the spike from binding to ACE2 to and, and yeah. basically you know, uh, sealing up the virus and uh, preventing it from spreading to the next cell. And, um, and there's several companies that have developed antibodies. We, we also developed an antibody in, in Berlin. Mm -hmm. um, it, I think it was very good antibody, but obviously so other companies were faster. So this hasn't gone into clinical development, but other um, sites in Germany has, have also done so, but at the moment we have several companies that have uh, products in place. And, and some of them, actually, if you give them early on, they prevent 85% of all hospitalizations and, and deaths. So that's a tremendously uh, uh, effective therapy and it's really not being discussed that much. Yes. And uh, that's something, if you wish, that's passive immunization. You're exactly. basically bringing, with one infusion, I'm, I'm bringing you to the state of a fully vaccinated person, at least for the humoral yeah. uh, immune defense. And, and it's very effective. So we need to learn how to deliver those right. antibodies more quickly to patients, actually in the outpatient setting. You've just gotten your PCR test, come in, get the infusion, mm -hmm. go home. And, and in 85% of the cases, you won't have to go to the hospital. And that would be great because, I mean, we can talk about that in the end. Right. We're going to see trouble in the hospitals. But um, so these are monoclonals. And 
yes, the, the general in cocktail was made famous by, by the former president and probably saved his life as well. And, um, well, and others yeah. are being made. And there's interesting uh, uh, things about biology to be learned about where those antibodies bind, because at some places the, the virus likes to mutate its spike protein and some of the early antibodies that were really good and were mutated away, anymore. basically the epitopes and the Delta variant basically is insensitive to neutralization by some of those early antibodies. And so that's why companies came in with two different types of antibodies. But there are also other antibodies that were actually developed against the original SARS yes. of one virus. So against some really uh, conserved epitopes and they, they can still neutralize. So, so we can learn different about. viruses, but they so both have spike virus that protein, spread, and that's why uh, yeah. some antibodies raised against the first wild virus can work against the SARS. -CoV you know, it's the same family of virus. Some yes. parts of it are actually identical, or at least uh, uh, immunologically identical. And then, and then there are people have heard that some drugs that have been in the news. Uh, um, yeah, recently oral, in Great Britain, they actually approved, they licensed yeah. uh, one drug uh, called um, well, which was, uh, yeah, it's, it's a great name. It, you know, Pure company always come up with a name that you can't pronounce. That's probably <laughs> but um, but but that's that's an inhibitor of the of the polymerase again, I think, of the virus. Yes. But it, what it actually does is that it makes the virus produce uh, errors in, in, in Exactly, in its, mutations its, actually, mutations. RNA, yeah. So um, we talked about vaccines later, but it's actually an RNA uh, a nucleotide, right? So a version of that, that, that just fools the virus into making errors and it's 800 milligrams. So, so if you're hesitant to taking in 30 micrograms of RNA as a vaccine, your choice would be to take 800 milligrams of this thing think, that makes actually that. your cells make mutations. So I'm just saying. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. it seems to be. Uh, you put it out there. I'm not yeah. sure if everybody got this, but yeah, I'm glad it's. Yeah, no, sorry, but it, it's, uh, no, it's just it's uh, one of the absurdities of the pandemic. But this seems to be reducing 50% of, of hospitalizations. Right. And just today, another company uh, released a press release. So they made uh, an inhibitor actually of the. SARS-CoV-2 um, polymerase. So they specifically. So this is very targeted. specific. Yeah. It seems yeah. to be specific and seems to be very effective. But and we'll have to wait to see the results. Yeah, and, variant, which is also, yeah. You know, um, at least that's what we think. You know, I don't know if the virus can start mutating away some of those yeah. uh, other pockets there, but are, probably yeah. not. Probably this is uh, something that you could use if it's a drug that you can take at home, a pill that would be very, very helpful. So let's hope that these. Uh, trials really pan out and, and, and help us out. And then the second phase is where you inhibit the inflammatory response. And I would say we target, we talked about the anti IL 6. Um, this is, I think, established. It's given to patients on the ICU. We have the dexamethasone that's given to all patients that need oxygen. So as, as soon as you have a pneumonia, you're, you're, you're being put on steroids, which in the case of very sick patients that need to stay on the ICU for a long time can then lead to other complications. We're talking complications, metabolic complications, uh, cardiovascular complications, or infections by fun fungi, for example, if you're you know, critically ill and have to stay on the ICU for a very long time. Nonetheless, this is uh, a mainstay of treatment mm -hmm. around the world. And there are some newer drugs that have been repurposed that have been used to treat rheumatoid arthritis or other, other diseases. Um, they, they target some uh, pathways of the interferon cascade and the jack stat this is the signaling cascade pathway and, and they're also being given their pills and they also seem to reduce um, the severity of the disease and, and improve outcome so those are i think currently the ones that we actually have lots of other drugs are being tested uh, and there was a there was a, a paper recently that came out and said you can use an antidepressant and improve survival so but i haven't really looked into the data maybe one of you has but but so so those are those are the things. The drugs that haven't worked is hydroxychloroquine. Also yeah, taking tons a, of uh, anti-helminth uh, paste doesn't seem to work uh, unless you're keen on getting diarrhea. So, um, so, so there's lots of myths out there that haven't worked, but some, some uh, really good successes have been made. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a brief yeah, answer on that. I mean, one important I, part that you also should just consider, I mean, these anti-inflammatory um, Drugs that that I've just talked about always always have these side effects. You know, so we have to keep them in mind. For example, dexamethasone okay. also can impair the immune. I mean, always impairs the immune system and can lead 
or can make people more prone to secondary yeah. infections like fungi and, and bacteria. But there is a very kind of thin line also. I have to be uh, aware of, uh, of, of time uh, and move the discussion uh, to the uh, last part that I really wanted to highlight, and that is how do we protect ourselves and others? And uh, I think the simplest answer at this point would be uh, not just you know wearing masks and distancing from each other, just for the audience, we are all tested today and are negative, and we are also vaccinated. So the fact that we're sitting close to each other is because it's actually safe. But um, let's talk about vaccines. Birgit, what can you tell us yeah. about that? I mean, but what Leif already mentioned, and this is very important, these antiviral uh, drugs and also the antibody treatment and the, with the neutralizing antibodies are given to patients. They only work in a very short time period. Yeah. yeah. So uh, if you miss that, then you they, you can only maybe get treated with the anti-inflammatory drugs. But what you can actually um, prevent very nicely with vaccination is that you develop such an overstimulation of the immune system. The vaccination will create a normal immune response with just normally stimulated, uh, activated T cells so that they do not activate the endothelial cells, do not lead to uh, damage of the vasculature and uh, maybe or increase the likelihood of, of coagulation and they will um, lead to a normal antibody response. And this can protect you from uh, not completely maybe from an infection, but can uh, protect you from an infection with a very high viral load, which would trigger all this I was just mentioning. So this is the best way of really saving you. Right? Um, well, uh, I would like to <clears throat> end on this note because we, will, we are actually running uh, a little bit out of time. So uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I would like to make some concluding remarks. Um, uh, so it's obvious by, by the presence of these fine people that Berlin is uh, a hub for uh, basic and clinical research uh, focused on COVID-19 and cardiovascular health. So uh, as Berliners, we should be actually proud that all this research has been done in Berlin from the bench to the bedside, and it's been going on. So uh, many of our panelists uh, uh, mentioned works, uh, works that were done in Berlin or Germany, but particularly Berlin, and they were really breakthrough uh, uh, works published in the, I'm talking about publishing because I'm in that line of work, in uh, very prestigious journals, meaning read by many, many scientists and clinicians. And uh, maybe Holger can uh, tell us more because Berlin is getting stronger on that front. So it's not that uh, we just have the institutions that are displayed on this screen, and that's uh, the BIH, the Charité Hospital, MDC. Let's talk about the, the next step and the expansion of science in Berlin. Well, the science in general is, thank you, is of course uh, very strong um, and uh, is growing political support, but also uh, intrinsic, uh, a strong growth in this, also in development of technologies. But unlike cancer research, which has been in everybody's uh, mind for, for decades, yeah. cardiovascular research, although it is an epidemic in itself, the disease in cardiovascular does not receive as much funding and as and much the number attention. one killer. And it is the number one killer. So um, Germany, um, through its health centers, um, but Berlin in particular, um, is, is looking at this particular issue and with a new um, bringing together of all the cardiology departments in one flagship uh, institute, which is happening. But also between the BIH, MDC, and Charité, we're building for that particular reason also the Berlin Center for Translational Vascular Biomedicine to address in particular the mechanisms of endothelial dysfunction, uh, adverse remodeling of the vessels that uh, drive hypertension, not only in the periphery, but also in the lung, um, predisposing for uh, respiratory disease, et cetera. Um, and also to build new model systems where to study this. Um, people might have heard of organoids. We're trying to right. develop vascularized organoids. Um, and we really try to 
get the strength of the entire community. We need to do this together with immunologists, because as I said, the vessels are the gateway for the immune system, and there's a very close relationship. Can you explain what the organoids are? Because I don't think the layman fever. So yeah. everybody knows about organs. Exactly. Um, an oid is something so this like is not an a asteroid small, is similar small to, organ. to a star. Um, an organoid is similar to an organ. Yeah. It's, it's much smaller. You can grow it in a dish. Um, where cells of different types will assemble into something that has structure and molecular and physiological features that resemble much of what the organ can do. The challenge with this is that you need to, in order to grow it beyond a certain size, be it a mini gut or a mini brain, you need blood vessels. Exactly. And that's a big challenge. That's the holy grail of organoids. Exactly. We really want to make a difference here and there are some promising developments in that. Well, that makes me very happy because as I said, I'm chief editor of a cardiovascular research journal and I would be happy that uh, uh, the community that actually works on this subject, well, I, I should say subjects, uh, is expanding here in, in, in the town where I live and where the hub of my journal is. Um, so, uh, um, I would just like to say that uh, uh, my journal is launching in 2022, so in a few months, in January 2022, and we are going to publish, as I already mentioned, uh, we are aiming to publish uh, very important uh, works in cardiovascular and blood biology. So if any uh, cardiovascular and blood biology scientists are listening to this, um, you know, to submit your work yeah. or uh, talk to me. And I'm very happy that I have these fine uh, researchers, clinicians here in Berlin that I can talk to. And um, I also invite you uh, very cordially, sincerely, to publish, to submit your work to, to our journal. Uh, and with this, um, I would like to end. I think we are a little bit over time. And to thank you all for, for this uh, very interesting uh, conversation. May I have the thank you slide because I would like to have <laughs> thank you many people who uh, some of us you can see. Uh, so of course I would like to thank all the panelists. Uh, I learned quite a bit here, and I hope the the audience did. But I would also like to uh, thank people that are behind the camera. Uh, some of them are here. Uh, I am not sure, so I'm, I'm I don't speak German yet. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pronounce these names properly, but uh, I would like to thank to Patricia or Patric Patricia Abel, Stephanie Selfman, Tanya Florin, Vera Glasser, Jutta Kram, Inkehert Tefera, Lian Detman, Poed, I think, El Hajj, I'm not really sure, uh, and Bart Barberet, who's my colleague. So with this, um, I would like to thank you and if you have any questions i'm gonna just take a look uh, if, if there are some questions in yeah they are uh we are going to uh start answering your your questions so let's start q a so what does the panel think about the pill against covid19 announced by pfizer is it real or hype would this mean that similar pills for other cardiovascular diseases can become a reality? I would like to answer that. I guess we heard already a little bit um, about it. Um, the second part of the question um, is difficult to answer because it really is, it is not about cardiovascular disease. This right. is really targeting the virus. Um, so I don't see that there is an obvious connection how it would relate um, to this. Um, the only connection could be there are many other viruses that specifically cause myocarditis, for example. And if such an approach would be helpful in stopping those viral infections, um, then it could be potentially, but I'm here way out of my depth. This is not my field when it comes to virology, but if I think what could be the connection, maybe other viral, uh, uh, complications in the cardiovascular system would be the only thing that comes to my mind, but maybe others have more ideas. Is it real or high? No, I, I think, I mean, 
it's good news. And these days we really have to appreciate all the good news that we right. can get. Um, however, this being said, it's press release. No, we haven't seen any data. Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, this is done within a clinical trial. So this is a highly selected study population that was selected for certain risks and that was specifically targeted. And what usually happens with these types of treatments that then, you know, uh, 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 doctors can give out to their patients is that they're not so well selected for the treatment and that maybe those really high and promising numbers don't, you know, pan out in the real world. Uh, this might be the case. For instance, uh, uh, for, for, for um, some of the treatments, you know, you, you see positive results in, in, in early trials and they don't pan out in bigger trials and sometimes it doesn't pan out that well in, in real world. And that's some of the suspicion that some virologists also have about those treatments because historically it has been so difficult to treat acute viral infections with antivirals. So, um, um, so this is why I'm still hesitant, but 90% prevention of hospitalization sounds really fantastic. You know, if we even can come, you know, out of this with 70%, that would be tremendous. Oh, let's hope and let's let's wait for the for the data and that being submitted yeah. to the regulatory bodies. And so hopefully it's more than the hype. Yeah. Let me kind of to, to exemplify what this mm -hmm. means. So for example, she would start coughing on, on Monday and then you would go to the source for the two test on, on Tuesday with that res positive result on Wednesday and the doctor's appointment on Thursday. You're kind of already out of the window and this drug is, is helpful and perhaps one aspect is that this drug might or, or also antivirus might be also used kind of preventively around outbreaks for example if there would be an outbreak in a nursing home mm -hmm. which i've always seen and we, we start to see again and that would be a good opportunity to just, just like preventively treat everybody in there uh, because they might have the virus but not be have symptoms yet so it's still there, in a phase it can be beneficial thing. Okay, so how does the current situation with COVID-19 compare to the 2002-2004 SARS outbreak? I think we touched upon that a little bit, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's not comparable because that virus, uh, I mean, something bad happened to the virus back then. So very early on in the pandemic, it kind of inactivated itself a little bit, so it lost part of its genome. And uh, the more aggressive regional variants could not could not spread by itself. And so this was the main reason. So this was also a reason why uh, yeah, we yeah, have much more action of the scientific. Exactly. Community. I mean, I mean, there is also some for some some lockdowns back then, for example, in Canada, that was uh, quickly contained the virus. Um, so I mean there was a lot to be learned after that. And I think a lot of also this research that led to this quick development of vaccines also based on, on SARS-CoV-2 uh, outbreak uh, 20 years ago and also on MERS 10 years ago. So this is the main reason why we have these efficient vaccines so quickly. Thank you. Um, next question is, how do the panelists see the pandemic evolve? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, this pandemic globally is still, you know, is still raging on. You know, vast parts of the world's populations have do not have access to vaccine. We have a highly contagious, very aggressive variant. It is a Delta variant, and we might see new variants uh, with more immune pressure. Uh, right. So this might happen globally. Yeah? Right. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you? Make it clear why uh, the po possibility to have uh, new variants that might be even worse than Delta exist. So we are talking about vaccination and people that are vaccinated are protected to a certain extent, extent from another infection. They might get infected if they're exposed to the virus. But, um, and then have milder consequences, uh, uh, milder disease. But there is a, a huge number of people that refuses to get vaccinated for whatever reason. Some of them are justified because of the compromised immune system, for example. Some of them are of a different nature. And uh, are these uh, 
populations? Are these uh, people sort of a brewing machinery for a new variants to, to appear? Or is this the a harsh? That uh, the rare variants that we've seen so far have always occurred under high incidence conditions with lots of right. viral spread. So the one Delta variant first emerged in India. Several lines of that actually emerged and one predominated and was then imported to Europe and spread from there. And, and, and at that time in India was a really, really bad time in the pandemic with really raging high numbers. So, and uh, the so-called South African now called beta variant also developed in some of the townships there with, with extremely high uh, transmission. So, How did that correlate with vaccination rate? No, I mean, if, if you have, it, it basically correlates with immunity in your population. If, you're, if you have few opportunities for a virus to spread, uh, there's less transmission events, less replications, and just a uh, lower chance for a, a mutant that obviously, uh, most of the mutants that will arise will, be, will not be beneficial for the virus and will basically lead to extinction, extinction of that line. And, very, very few variants will have the advantage over everybody else and then predominate and spread. And, um, and if you have high levels of immunity and very few susceptible hosts, you can, you, there's less chance of, of viral, um, of viral uh, uh, um, mutation. That's my you know, simple understanding of virology and I'm not a virologist. But what does seem to be a, another possibility is that with high levels of immunity, there is so-called immune pressure on the virus, and it might find ways to evade parts of the immune response. However, the virus does not profit from making you very sick. Um, it just profits from quickly infecting you. It's, it's an in and out situation. The virus just needs to get in and spread to the next person. It's not like malaria or HIV, TB that needs to go and persist and hide from your immune system for, for years and invest a lot of energy into doing so. This virus doesn't invest energy into that. It just needs to infect quicker. That's why the variants that we've seen have mainly been ones that are better at infecting, producing higher numbers of viral copies in a faster time. And this is also some of the reason why Delta infects people despite of vaccination, because even if you have a proper memory response, it takes just two, three days for it to really fix dust. And that's enough for the virus to infect cells if you have the respiratory tract and then maybe even transmit it to the next person. So, so this are, these are some of the, of the aspects. Um, so, so for sure, there's gonna be, you know, if, if you allow a lot of viral transmission, you're basically setting up a laboratory for, for creating more variants. Um, and if you allow for less viral transmission, it's just because it's all a matter of chance. So all the vaccines, they are basically, regardless if they're RNA or DNA based, they or just you know um, made the, the old fashioned way, they um, are uh, causing antibody production that could target spike, uh, the spike protein. Am I right? So basically, they're uh, targeting the protein that is important for uh, cell infection. And uh, uh, is there um, a change? Is that uh, uh, these uh, antibodies that we make and vaccine efficiency can uh, decline with time uh, because of the mutations that can affect this interaction, the binding of the spike protein to the receptor. And uh, thus, as, as Birgit, I think, said at a certain point, basically, when the antibody binds to the spike protein, it prevents it from binding to its receptor, and then it's done, you know? So, is, is this a possibility that uh, we might get um, a variant where uh, the vaccines would not be, um, well, the antibodies that we produce as, as a response to the vaccines wouldn't be that effective? Well, then we produce two, two flavors of immune response, and one is very good's favorite, this one, which is T cell yeah. cellular mm -hmm. immunity. And this cellular immunity seems to be targeting epitopes that the virus doesn't really like to mutate uh, versus the epitopes, which also facilitate binding to the receptor and viral entry, as well as neutralization by antibodies are more variable. And there are some variants such as the beta variant um, that are harder to neutralize than the alpha or the delta variant. And we've seen 
you know, other uh, 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 versions of, of, of the spike and the virus that have even more mutations that reduce your neutralizing capacity. Luckily, we also form antibodies against other epitopes. And it seems that, for instance, if you've been infected and then you get vaccinated, you really broaden your immune response in a way that you target so many different epitopes, it'll be and that's basically the impossible I actually want to uh, here, for the virus. Basically, to vaccination uh, does several things, not just making the, the antibodies, but also... However, uh, the antibodies are your... really critical. Yes, huh? yes. So the antibodies are declining. We see that especially yeah. in older people, they are declining. That's a normal thing. You have an acute reaction with high levels of antibodies, they sort of contract to a baseline level. And that would usually be enough if this was a virus that would spread through the bloodstream. That's enough because that's then it's not, basically yeah. where it stops because it gets neutralized. But if it's so local, you need such high levels of antibodies to completely block it. That's why we're seeing breakthroughs. And this is why we need booster vaccinations at the moment. Okay. Um, let's move on. In South America, they are using invermectin preventive as well as treatment. Uh, also nebuliz nebulization with the 0.03 solution of uh, H2O2. Are they being used here? Uh, is treatment with antibodies actually being used in Germany? I guess uh, the... Uh, whoever, uh, <laughs> so ivermectin is, 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 uh, is really a myth. There have been studies that have been highly flawed and there have been other studies that have clearly disproven the benefit. In, on the contrary, that people eating, this is a drug mainly used in animals for, for, you know, for deworming animals. And for some reason, you know, there are some molecular explanations why anti-hermetic drugs might work. They might work on certain aspects in cellular machinery that in theory could you know, work, but it just doesn't work in real life. Real life. And so people have been buying ivermectin made for animals and have experienced pretty harsh side effects. Uh, um, What's happening in Brazil? Uh, so I think the most frequent one is diarrhea in situations where you can't control it. And so, so that, well, that's, that's a choice you can make, but in, in the end, this is something that does not work, unfortunately. It was, would be great if we had a super cheap a drug that's already there in vast amounts and it could just be repurposed, but unfortunately it doesn't work. Um, so, so, and it's not being used here and we're not recommending uh, to use it. Same, unfortunately, hydroxychloroquine was a drug that right. has been used for malaria, doesn't work. Advertised by Trump as well? Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry, I mean, the, the yeah, American yeah. in me just comes <laughs> out. That's so. true. And the H2O2 is, I think, maybe also on the recommendation of the former president who, who um, oh, recommended yeah, instilling uh, uh, mm -hmm. disinfectants. So, so I, I, we don't use that. Antibodies are actually available in Germany. Um, they are free. Are they um, already licensed? So uh, the antibodies are expected to be licensed in November but they were bought uh, on, uh, on a um, compassionate use program uh, last year. By, they were purchased by the, by the German Ministry of Health because at that time it was unclear whether the vaccine trials would be successful. These were highly promising drugs. And actually, if you just start using them, they will prevent, you need to treat something between 10 and 20 people and you can prevent one person from going to the ICU. So I think that's very good cost benefit ratio. You just have to, deliver them, we give them a charity. So if you're newly diagnosed with COVID, you have some risk factors, there are numbers uh, provided by the RKI that you can that you can call in Germany and you can get an infusion of antibiotics at one time infusion, you go home after two hours, and that's basically it. Can you tell us more about the antibody cocktail? What does that mean? Uh, it's obviously, just that, that obviously these are it's a mix mono, of different monoclonal exactly. so antibodies. Monoclonal antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies means that there's one single B cell that was made by the immune system of somebody previously infected uh, with, with, uh, with SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then those antibodies were cloned and produced. So you just have this one type of antibody. So and it comes from a real person. This that's, comes from a real person. That's basically yeah. utilizing someone else's immune defense 
to protect tons of people. Right. So, so this is this is I think a great concept. Use the immunity of you to protect many. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's just that you know the production and the administration is more cumbersome than giving a, a, a pill. Right. Um, how many do they combine? Yes, that no, was just two. Just Only two. two. General, yes. Only two. So for Please. for I mean, this started the whole thing neutralizing antibodies. I mean, if you wish, this has a historic perspective um, because Emil von Dering developed serum therapy right around the corner here a uh, uh, hundred years ago and, and got the Nobel Prize for that, right? Because, and, and basically he was giving serum from, at that time it was people and horses uh, that had recovered or been infected and then, you know, contain antibody mixtures and gave it to people to protect them from diphtheria, uh, a disease that was killing children uh, at the time. And so this is, and this has been done for, for decades, right? You can give serum, or the next thing was you can purify the immunoglobulins in that serum and give hyperimmune serum. We still do that, but this is really the 21st century version of yes, that, that you, you call like the, you know, the ones that you need yeah. and all the rest you, you leave aside. And and that's it's been tried for HIV mm -hmm. uh, because very, very few people are capable of producing antibodies that are broadly neutralized. So most people develop antibodies that can't neutralize all the different, because the virus escapes, them, right? And very few people are, are capable of doing so. And you can go take antibody, take B cells from those people, clone those and develop antibodies. But HIV is such a tricky virus that actually you need to come in with a lot of different antibodies that in the end, the only way for the virus to escape that neutralization would be suicide basically so so that wouldn't allow so so but that's something where people tried covid is much more simple two antibodies seem to be fully sufficient might be that the virus still comes up with some more mut uh, mutations um but but that's basically what's been done now there's another antibody in development that i said was developed against the original sars virus right and it just targets a pocket because if it neutralizes sars and sars cov2 it's a very good indication. This is evolutionarily conserved and it's not helpful for the virus to get rid of it. And so it seems to be a very good site where you could target uh, antibodies. And these two antibodies, are those the same that the Regeneron? Uh, those are the those Regeneron, are the Regeneron antibodies. Regeneron. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And there was another company that made one antibody that through the emergence of variants was made basically useless. And then they um, provide a second antibody to this, you know, to create a cocktail. Uh, and in hindsight, and then it works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, viral RNA load in plasma is associated with critical COVID-19. Might the circulating viral RNA itself be a trigger of inflammation? This is this is being discussed actually. That um, mm -hmm. I mean, not all, no, no, not not always was COVID infection. That circulating RNA can act as a stimulator. So let's just explain what does that mean. That means not it's not a virus. It's just it's genetic material, exactly. right? It's and the genetic material of, of viruses of RNA viruses are by themselves kind of triggered for the immune system. So this these are RNA molecules for RNA viruses, and this is the same for the mRNA vaccine that we're using. So this is also an RNA molecule, and if you have that vaccine, you experience like this. One or two days of side effects that were like fever and so on. And this is something that can also happen with fragments of the genome of RNA viruses that they circulate and stimulate the immune system in a way that might be beneficial, but perhaps also detrimental. Okay, thank you. Is the booster against the actual mutants, Delta and other, which appeared in South America? Um, this is, a, I think, a few words are missing, but I guess the, the meaning is uh, uh, whether the boosters will help us against the uh, upcoming uh, variants, booster vaccines. So the boosters are the, the the, still the same vaccine yeah. that was designed against the original virus that was identified in Wuhan. Um, and the immune system doesn't just target a few sites. Luckily, it targets lots of sites and its T cells and lots of uh, tools in its uh, in, in its toolbox to fight the virus. And the booster is really a booster. It's not just a refresher that brings the level of immunity back to where it was after the second vaccination. We've done studies. Um, it really boosts the level of 
antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, and as well as T cell responses above levels that you had obtained with the original prime boost, like one vaccine and another one right after. Um, right. And so, and, and Israel did that in a very systematic and, and effective way and boosted its entire population that had that was you know basically um, you know, uh, accepting vaccines. The vaccinated population, obviously, it's also in Israel, people about 30% of the population or, or 25 mm -hmm. that have not uh, gotten the vaccine. And the booster creates, can, can, can uh, basically boost your protection uh, really by 10 to 20 fold compared to a person that has received two shots. So it's really highly effective measure. It reduces transmission. It reduces the so-called R, so the uh, uh, R values also where, where yes. you know, yeah. it basically allows you to calculate how fast the virus spreads. And so this is basically also apart from, you know, protecting yourself from breakthrough, it's a very effective public health intervention that can be done. And it works with the old version of uh, the vaccine. Um, it might be at some point that there is a ver that there's a variant where those vaccines really lose lots of their potency. I don't think so, but in that case, those mRNA vaccines are very versatile and they can be developed in such a quick way to adopt. Um, and, and so the groundwork for that is being laid so that in the case, it can be delivered quickly. So when a, a person that has been vaccinated twice should uh, actually go for a booster, uh, in the United States, I see that they are calling people depending on age more uh, than on when exactly they were vaccinated. But then again, in the US, uh, the vaccination uh, terms, let's say, were opening up uh, for studying from older people and then going down the, the age ladder, let's say, younger and younger people. Um, so when should one get or start thinking about getting a booster? As a rule of thumb, six months. Six. But it's a linear decline. It's not, it's not like you have a few months and then everything drops and you're unprotected. That's not how right. it goes. And, and, but it's also arbitrary, obviously, six months. That's not how biology works. Very dependent on how old you are. And one thing I think that it would be good to discuss in this panel, because many people can get a breakthrough infection and they'll, they'll be fine because they got vaccinated. They'll never be in the hospital. They'll be sick for one day or two and not even notice. But what the Israelis noticed early on, and because they have such great, you know, access to their clinical data, they noted that people with preconditions, they tend to actually, when some of them can actually develop severe disease, and it's the number of preconditions, and preconditions such as cardiovascular, hypertension, diabetes, uh, uh, COPD, asthma, as well as cancers, so just pretty frequent preconditions, so it's more your biological age, and the number of preconditions. And you really look, if you have zero preconditions, you're probably pretty fine. And with every precondition, that risk increases. So you study out this week. Um, and, and so this is, you should uh, face this in a risk adapted manner. But it's clear the longer, the more time that has elapsed since your vaccination, the, the more time you've given the immune system to basically uh, decrease. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, it's a matter of risk. Uh, and you can really see, I mean, we've discussed, uh, uh, we've discussed cardiovascular risk factors, but the really main risk factor is age. And if you're above the age of 80, you have, you know, uh, um, an, I think a risk that is 600 fold higher of dying than a 30 year old. So right. even if you decrease that risk with a vaccine by 90%, you're still way higher at risk than, than an unvaccinated young person. And so this is why these people were vaccinated first, they have by far the highest risk. And this is why in the States, as well as here, we're recommending for those people to go get the shot. So what's the situation in Germany? When I arrived here, that was me. Uh, the situation was not that great. It was much worse than in the United States when it, uh, uh, in terms of vaccination, there were, there were not enough vaccines. And uh, of course there was a very, uh, uh, fine system uh, in place to vaccinate people. Uh, it was very clear uh, what was the order of the people that should get the vaccine, but there was just not enough vaccines at that time to go really fast in vaccinating the, the population. And that got fixed quite, quite quickly. 
So I arrived here on May 1st, but the end of May that was fixed. You know, it was, the vaccination was taking, uh, it was going much, much, much faster. So um, I read recently that not all vaccines actually uh, produce, um, so they all produce antibodies, but the, some of them, uh, the, 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 let's say, the baseline uh, after six months, but some of them actually produce uh, either more or long last. I mean, the, the, the effect is longer lasting. I'm not sure why, but it is uh, longer lasting. So uh, is, uh, is there a, a rule now in Germany uh, in place, you know, you should get the booster and, and now, because I haven't heard anything about it. My company usually sends out emails, you know, you should get vaccinated. Uh, uh, these are the places where you can get the vaccine when I arrive to Germany. What's going on now in Germany in this mm -hmm. in this uh, context? I'm sorry, I didn't want to ask an, uh, a question that is that it, it, it's a you know public health issue. Um, yeah, the situation is you just clear. said six months. Uh, it's been almost that's, I mean, that's here the, in November. That's the recommendation right now, yeah. and I think it was announced uh, today uh, mm -hmm. by the Ministry of Health that. Everybody can get a booster shot when once six months have elapsed. Okay. And but this is not a definitely not a dogmatic time frame. So it's if you're five and a half months away and you're at risk of high exposure, get the jab. Every booster that you give is better than a booster that you don't give. So so it's not a dogmatic thing. But the rule now is clearly if it, if it's been six months since you received your second shot, you are uh, you're eligible and you should get a booster. So that's the, the thing matter of the fact is that in Germany, since we didn't have enough vaccines, so everybody who qualifies right now will, per definition, fall into the category of being at risk because in the beginning, we vaccinated older people, people with preconditions and medical personnel. So those are the ones that qualify now. Right, but booster. overall, I mean, as, as we go along, and it's right now not a matter of being qualified or not, it's a matter of getting the logistics up and running again. That's what I want to ask. Do we do we have it? Do no. we have enough oh. We have the enough vaccines are but available, but we don't have the workforce. logistics yeah. in place as we had. We had these big um, centers. Luckily in Berlin, we didn't shut down all of them. We have two that we can revigorate, and we uh, had these uh, flying teams, if you wish, that went into right. uh, the nursing homes. What I think we didn't have enough of is like this really these pop up sites where you could just get vaccinated, you know, on the go. And, and we probably need to do that because at the rate we're going now with 150,000 vaccines given every day, you know, it will take until uh, next summer to uh, deliver all the boosters. And that's basically um, really not uh, that's uh, that's not so, the purpose. So what vaccines do we have now? Uh, before it was mostly Pfizer. Uh, what is it now? There's four licensed vaccines, two vector well, in general, vaccines. But in Germany, I, I in mean, Germany, we have yeah. the availability for of four Equal different vaccines. Availability for all of them, or there is one that's more. It, you, if you can get every vaccine, but uh, just to be clear, for the booster shots, you should get an mRNA vaccine. And which one you take, I think, is academic. So you should get an mRNA vaccine. And why is that? That's the uh, that's either the one produced by a company called Moderna or one. Was developed by a German company actually, yeah. BioNTech, and, and it's been co-produced by yeah. Pfizer. Yeah, I yeah call it Pfizer because that's how it's called in the United States. But I'm well aware it was made in Germany, and then. <laughs> um, but my question was why uh, you should get an mRNA uh, vaccine as a booster as opposed to DNA or just you know. So DNA vaccines are not licensed. Uh, so um, you just have a choice uh, of vector or mRNA. And vector vaccines. It's a, it's a viral infection, maybe uh, uh, Emmanuel, I somebody can explain. Yeah. But uh, you need, to, if you want to boost, you need something. You know, we want something that's fast acting, and the uh, mRNA vaccines are fast acting. Ideally, we'd probably even use a protein vaccine for vaccination, but they're not licensed, they're not available. We don't have data. We have great data from Israel on right. you know, a third shot of the Bio BioNTech vaccine. And, and so that's the way to go. Thank you. And it's very safe. Um, so they, we, I've seen safety data from Israel. It's, it's uh, the re reactogenicity is similar yeah. to the second shot, and the rates of myocarditis or whatever that are very, very rare 
uh, even lower than uh, the previous shots. So it's a safe way to boost your immune system. Though, so you should get out, go out and get it. Well, thank you. Uh, we have no more questions. Uh, I would like to thank you all again. Um, this was really uh, very um, informative for me, also very pleasant, even though the subject itself might not be <laughs> as pleasant. Uh, I'm very happy to um, have the honor to moderate this session. And uh, I have thanked uh, many people, but uh, I forgot to actually thank the, the organizations that actually made this possible by some financial by, by, by financial contributions and also brain contributions. So I would like to thank to, to uh, uh, BIH, uh, MDC, uh, Charité Hospital. Did I miss someone? Um, I guess not. Um, and of course, the Berlin Science Week for providing us the platform to talk about this uh, subject. I hope uh, that um, many people got answers to some questions. Um, and with that, I would like to conclude our panel discussion. Thank you all. <laughs>